All right, so there were uh, s some additional presentations uh, looking a little bit more closely this year at the impact of uh, baseline fish testing. The, f the first uh, is 1Q21, uh, and I, I guess the realization that this is an important uh, risk factor that we haven't been always incorporating or looking at. And then looking more closely at 1114, which we've up to now at least considered to be a, a, a good uh, prognostic factor. And so what did we see presented here? And there are several things interesting here. This is uh, data from uh, China, from uh, Changjin, where they have uh, a huge database with good uh, fish testing. And you can see here uh, for both PFS and overall survival, the combination of the presence of the 1Q21 gain and 414 is definitely the uh, most uh, important negative combination. Yeah. So we, we do need to be aware of that. And, and uh, we're, we're looking to uh, assess 1Q plus more, more routinely. Uh, the, the, this is, this is the, the other uh, observation has been uh, the opposite kind of observation, where if you have uh, translocation 1114, uh, those patients actually seem to do uh, significantly better with autologous stem cell transplant. And it, it may be, since the, we looked at that in the French studies where transplant was frequently used, it may be one of the reasons that we always felt like 1114 was good. Uh, but I think without doubt, the greatest interest at this meeting was what was the follow-up for the Bellini trial mm. Uh, in which venetoclax was given uh, to patients with uh, BCL2 uh, overexpression uh, in combination. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a concern uh, and the study was stopped, as, as we know, uh, because of uh, increased uh, deaths in, in the combination arm. Uh, however, with the update here, uh, in, in July, uh, the, the, the survival outcomes uh, have actually balanced out uh, somewhat, and with more detailed evaluation, what was presented in a very striking way is that certainly for the T1114 population, uh, the uh, combination uh, with bortezomib and dex plus venetoclax is clearly uh, dramatically helpful. Uh, the role of the BCL2 uh, is, is a little bit more complicated because some patients can have overexpression but don't have the 1114. And so you can see also for the non 1114, uh, really that uh, added benefit, you, you just don't see that. So uh, in, in this uh, discussion, uh, how do you view the uh, impact of, of uh, 1Q plus? And uh, obviously, do we need to be looking at that more closely and thinking about that as part of our trials? Uh, who wants to comment? You want to talk about sure, that? Yeah, first? I can start with with these two. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you captured it well at the start. I, I think for a lot of patients who historically we didn't characterize it high risk, but they seem to behave, if you will, as a high risk patient. Are, are, many of them are quite likely because of that 1Q. And I think what's interesting about the 1Q compared to some of the other um, cytogenetic abnormalities we look at, I mean, to a certain degree, we see this with P53, but it, it depends on the degree of the 1Q. The more gain, the more a concern. You know, as we've created even double hit myeloma yeah, when there was part more of double than three. Or triple but hit. also, the, but yeah. also the partner, well, the, the cytogenetic abnormalities partner from plus 1Q. We have analyzed our large series of patients, included yes. in the Spanish myeloma group, and plus 1Q as isolated abnormality did not impact very uh, much in the really? prognosis. And the poor prognosis is, as you mentioned, by the addition of another high-risk cytogenetic abnormality. Uh. What is uh, very important, because definitely I consider that these patients with plus 1Q plus uh, 414 translocation or other high-risk cytogenetic abnormality should be treated as high, high risk. risk. Yes, I, I agree so with very that. Very important I, point. I, yeah. Absolutely, especially because we do so often see them in combination. I mean, one Q by itself is actually fairly common yeah. if yes. we look for it very yes. carefully. Yes. That's why the more copies are not as common yeah. uh, or seeing it in combination. So I, 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 I do think it's reasonable to treat these patients as high risk. And when it comes to 1114, I, I think we've really learned at this meeting, not just from the results of the Blini study, there were two other presentations looking right. at using venetoclax in the translocation 1114 population, really demonstrating great response. Even patients who are essentially 
uh, pentarefractory, meaning they had seen the five major drugs, had been had gone through just about everything, still had a very good response rate to venetoclaxin, dexamethasone. That was Jonathan Kaufman's paper, um, and, and so uh, although you know we still think of myeloma as a relatively a uniform disease when we start with DVRD or DKRD, maybe mm -hmm. high-risk, standard risk. Uh, it, there's no doubt that biologically 1114 myeloma is a little bit different and maybe particularly responsive to venetoclax, although we have to be careful now, obviously, in light of the Bellini uh, situation when we use it, but I'd be comfortable using it in that 1114 population with or without bortezomib um, to try and uh, control that disease. And we have so many patients right. that have really benefited from that, Absolutely. even if they haven't Absolutely. used the others. And lastly, I, I, we just still do transplant these patients for sure. Right. Whether it's the transplant effect particularly so, or just giving them appropriate intense therapy, I'm not sure there's something biologically between high dose melphalan and 1114 that we've really discovered yet. But right. in general, uh, as we've said before, we, we haven't quite yet dispensed with transplant by any means, it's still the standard of care, but right. in particular in 1114 patient, I, I would, right. I would yeah. offer the transplant so, so, so eligible. Th th there was a hope uh, before a year ago that uh, venetoclax uh, with uh, benefit in the combination, it would be rapidly moving uh, into earlier scenarios, mm -hmm. for example, even for 1114, but I think my sense is that maybe uh, we need to be a little bit cautious now as we move it into uh, different regimens perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, the sub-analysis conducted in the Bellini study are excellent, especially for patients, because we were able to identify how patients with 11-14 translocation benefit in terms of progression-free survival from venetoclax. So this is important because, uh, well, all during this year, in June, July, we were going to waste venetoclax for patients with right. multiple myeloma. So now I agree with you, we have to be cautious. The benefit is uh, there in terms of progression free survival. There is not any benefit yet in terms of overall oh, survival. survival, but I think that it will be a promising drug to be used in this specific population. Right. And concerning the role of transplant in 11-14 translocation, the reason is because patients with 11-14 translocation are more closer to non-Hodgkin lymphoma than to myeloma, in the sense that these patients usually do not present with a very high monoclonal component, much more plasma cell bone marrow infiltration, and this is the reason why transplant works more very effective. well in these patients. Mm -hmm. A lot of good points there. So very, very good. So there was a lot of discussion of that, and uh, and certainly um, uh, even at the IMWG breakfast, we paid attention to this, where we're talking about uh, incorporating one Q plus into a revised uh, ISS uh, staging system, yes. and I think we probably need to do that in a systematic way, but based on data. Mm -hmm.